Hello students, in the previous chapters we studied how the British were able to expand their rule in India. They had come as traders in the beginning of the 17th century but by the end of the 19th century they had control over all of the Indian subcontinent. You know that this process was not without resistance from the native rulers. Then what did the British do to these native rulers? They either meddled in the political and economic affairs of these rulers or defeated them in battles and chose the next ones. They also introduced new laws so that they could get more territories under their control. Now why did the British want the control of these territories? They wanted to control the resources and revenue systems of these areas. With the revenue from these areas, they would buy goods, finance battles and get control of even more areas. But the British were not only interested in territorial conquests and controlling the revenues of the area, they also had a cultural mission that was civilizing the natives by changing their customs and practices. Now what does the word civilize mean? The word civilize means to become well mannered, that is develop good habits and have good taste in arts. It also means to develop from a barbaric culture, one in which the technology is undeveloped and develop it into an advanced culture, one in which the technology is advanced. Now why did the British feel that they needed to civilize the natives? They felt that Indians were barbaric, that our customs and practices were cruel and oppressive and they thought that it was their duty to civilize the natives and make them into good subjects and change their customs and practices so that it would suit the British interests. Some of the ideas that they had about undeveloped or primitive people and the steps taken by them to civilize them were actually quite horrible and wrong. But they used this claim to justify their colonial rule in India. Then how did the British plan to civilize the natives of India? They introduced new laws and established an education system. In this lesson, we will be focusing on the steps taken by the British to civilize the natives of India. Look at this picture. What are these pictures showing? Does it look familiar? This one is a picture showing a village patshala which was the school in India before the British arrived. And this one is a present day classroom having all the new technological facilities. What do you see in these pictures? The students are sitting on the ground they are wearing dhotis. What is the teacher doing? He appears to be instructing the students with a big stick in his hand. What do you think the students are doing? They are writing as the teacher is instructing them. Do you see any girls among them? All the students are boys. Some boys look older than others, right? What could this mean? Students sat together even if they were of different ages. This must mean that they did not have separate classrooms for older and younger students. How about the surroundings of the Patshala? The students are sitting outside a thatched house. There appears to be a bigger building next to it with a palm tree and a banana plant. Now look at this picture. What all do you see in it? The students are seated on tables and chairs and they are wearing uniforms. All of the students seem to be similar in age and there are girls in the class as well. What is the teacher doing? The teacher appears to be showing the students a video. What about the classroom? The class is held inside a building and the students have books in their hands. You can see that there have been several changes in the classroom environment and student organization in the time between these two pictures. 
A lot of these changes were due to the influence of the British. Let us look at some of the British officials who led this change. Do you remember N.B. Halhead and what he did? If you do remember, N.B. Halhead or Nathaniel Brassi Halhead had translated a digest of Hindu laws as part of the British efforts to bring uniformity in the legal system. He was interested in Indian culture and knowledge and studied it. Another person who was interested to learn about the Indian culture was William Jones. He was a linguist and a jurist. A linguist is someone who knows and studies many languages, while a jurist is someone who is an expert in law. William Jones came to Calcutta in 1783 when he was appointed as a junior judge in the Supreme Court set up by the East India Company. Look at the sentence taken from the textbook and read out the languages he knew. You can see that he knew Greek, Latin, French, English, Arabic, Persian and Sanskrit. Now that is a lot of languages. With the knowledge of these languages, he was able to study the Indian texts on law, religion, medicine, politics, etc. The next person that we are going to study is Henry Thomas Colebrook. He was a Sanskrit scholar and a mathematician. He studied the Sanskrit language and was able to translate many Sanskrit texts. You might remember him from the extract in your textbook where he describes the conditions of undertenance in the Rayatwari system. The next person that we are going to learn about is James Mill. Do you remember him? In the first chapter, you had learned that he had written a book, A British History of India, in which he had divided the Indian history into three periods, Hindu, Muslim and British. He had a bad opinion about Indian culture and practices, even though he personally never studied the original Indian sources. Still, another person who had similar views on the Indian culture was Thomas Babington Macaulay. He wrote his views on Indian knowledge in his Minutes on Indian Education. He considered Indian knowledge inferior to Western knowledge, but he too had not studied the original Indian sources of knowledge. Can you find out the main difference among the five people? The first three studied the Indian culture and mastered Indian languages, while the last two studied the Indian culture but not using the original sources of Indian knowledge. Instead, they relied on British testimonies and records. These two groups held the two distinct opinions on Indian education and these opinions led to the changes in the Indian education system later on. The first group including Jones, Halhead and Colebrook were known as the Orientalist and the second group including Mill and Macaulay were called the Anglicists. Now let us look at both these groups. The Orientalists are those who have a scholarly knowledge of the language and culture of Asian societies. They studied Asian texts, translated them and made their studies known to other people. They supported traditional education, that is the education that was present in India before British rule. They thought that teaching the natives Indian knowledge would help the British win the love and respect of the natives and help the British understand the natives better. Jones along with Halhead and Colebrook started the Asiatic Society of Bengal and set up the journal Asiatic Researchers to promote the study of Indian languages and culture. To promote the learning of Indian literature in Sanskrit, Persian and Arabic, they started the Calcutta Madrasa in 1781 and the Hindu Banaras College in 1791 under the rule of the Governor General Warren Hastings. Now let us understand the second group, the Anglicists. The Anglicists are those who have a scholarly knowledge 
of English literature and language. They wanted to teach Indians the Western scientific knowledge and English. This they thought would have a practical use in the lives of Indians. They felt that the oriental knowledge was useless, inferior and unscientific when compared to the Western knowledge. Defending this view, Thomas Macaulay says that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. They wanted the government to stop promoting Indian knowledge and instead promote Western education. They hoped that this would create British tastes among the natives. Where do we find these anglicistic views? We can find them in Thomas Macaulay's Minutes on Indian Education. This document formed the basis for the English Education Act of 1835. By this act, English was made the medium of instruction in higher education and English textbooks were provided for schools. They also decided to stop promoting the Oriental Colleges like the Calcutta Madrasa and Banaras Hindu College. They were seen as temples of darkness that were responsible for their own decay. Two decades later, we have a new educational policy that was enacted in India. In 1854, the Woods Dispatch was issued by the Court of Directors of the East India Company. This act helped in spreading Western education in India. What do we know about Woods Dispatch? The dispatch was prepared under Charles Wood, the president of the board of control of the company. According to the dispatch, the Western system of education would have practical benefits as opposed to the Oriental education. It mainly discussed the economic and moral benefits of Western education. They were of the opinion that Western education would help Indians recognize the advantages of expanding trade and commerce and also the importance of developing resources in the country. It emphasized introducing the European way of life among the Indians so that it would change their tastes and desires and create a demand for British goods. The dispatch argued that Western education would improve the moral character of Indians, make the people honest and become trustworthy civil servants of the British. It also stated that Oriental knowledge would not develop a sense of duty commitment to work or even skills necessary for administration. Based on the dispatch, the British established education departments to control the entire education system in India. It also introduced a system of university education and we have the establishment of universities of Calcutta, Madras and Bombay in 1857. So far, we have seen the changes the British brought in the university education or higher education. Now, let me ask you a few questions. How were the children in India taught before the British rule? Were there schools at all? If there were, what happened to these schools under the British rule? Before the British came, we had padshalas in India. These padshalas were vernacular schools that were usually started by the wealthy people, the local community or by a single teacher or guru. The term vernacular refers to a local language which is distinct from a standard language. In colonial countries like India, the British used the term to differentiate between local languages and English. In vernacular schools, the local language is used as the medium of instruction. For example, now we have schools in India that use regional languages like Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, Marathi, Hindi, etc. as the medium of instruction. How do we know about these Padshalas? We get the information about these Padshalas from old paintings, documents and reports of Europeans. Do you remember this picture? We have already seen it earlier. 
it was painted by the Dutch painter Francois Solvin who had come to India in the late 18th century. This picture gives us an idea about how the Patshalas would have looked like in those times. We can also understand about Patshalas from the report of William Adam. He was a Scottish missionary who was assigned by the company to report on the progress of vernacular schools during the 1830s. He reported that there were over 1 lakh Patshalas in Bengal and Bihar alone and each of them taught no more than 20 students. But a total of 20 lakh students were taught in these Patshalas. Now, how were the classes in these Patshalas organized? There were no benches, tables, desks, blackboards or even a separate school building or classrooms. Classes were held under the open air under trees, in village shops, in temples and even in the Guru's house. The teacher or the Guru decided what was to be taught and taught it orally. The rich paid more fees than the poor and there was no regular timetable or annual examinations. Do you know why these schools did not have a regular timetable? There were students from almost all parts of the society in the school and some of them had to help their families so that they would have food and shelter. The timetable was made flexible so that it could be changed according to the collective needs of the students. For instance, classes were not held during harvest and only resumed after all the activities related to the harvesting were done. So what changes did the Woods Dispatch bring into the schools? Till the Woods Dispatch, the British were only interested in higher education in India. So they did not interfere with the functioning of the Patshalas. But after 1854, they decided to improve the vernacular system of education. They imposed new routines, rules and regular inspections. Government pundits or teachers were appointed to look after four to five schools each. They had to visit these Patshalas, improve the standard of teaching and submit regular reports to the company. It was compulsory to have regular classes with a regular timetable and the teaching was based on the textbooks provided and learning was tested through annual examination. All the students had to pay a regular fee even if they were from a poor economic background. All the Padshalas that accepted the new rules were given grants and government support. While those Padshalas that did not accept the new rules, they did not get any support from the government and found it hard to compete with the aided Padshalas. So how did the new education system affect the students? All the students had to attend regular classes, sit in their allotted seats, study from the textbooks given and prepare for the annual examinations. But the regular fees and attendance demanded by the new system made it difficult for students from poor families and farming families to attend these schools. Do you see any problem in the new education system? Yes, it could not give education to everybody. The students from lower classes and poor families found it difficult to attend classes under the new system. Thus, we see that the civilizing mission could not reach everybody. Then why did the British continue educating the natives? By giving western education, the British thought that they could hire Indians as civil servants instead of bringing Europeans for all the civil posts. They thought that they could create a demand for British goods by creating British tastes among the Indians. In this lesson, we have learned the ideas and practices of education in India during the British rule. We saw how education was seen as a way to civilize the natives and justify the British rule in India. We discussed the two opposing groups that influence the education system in India. The Orientalists who favor traditional Indian and Eastern knowledge 
and the Anglicists who favoured Western knowledge and learning of English. We discussed the English Education Act of 1835 and the Woods Dispatch in 1854. We also discussed the old and new Patshala system and their differences. I want you to think about this question. Do you think that the Western education helped in civilizing the natives in any way? The new education system turned many natives against their own culture, but it also helped the Indians to recognize the cruel and oppressive practices in India and change them. This also influenced the national leaders and their vision of how a national education system would be. Though some people strongly supported Western education, others strongly criticized it. We will discuss about this in the next lesson. Look at this timeline. It shows the events that influenced Oriental education in India. I want you to do a small assignment. Make a timeline that visually represents the various events that had influenced the Indian education system under the British rule. You can include pictures and quotes of the people involved. With this, find out if there has been a shift in the British approach to educating Indians from an orientalistic approach to an anglicistic approach. Take care of yourself. Goodbye.